tonight, growing anger about the prison transfer of one of Canada's most infamous criminals. Shock and disbelief. It was like putting a, a you know, a, a spike through their chest. The questions, why now and why no official reasons? New warnings about Canada's wildfires. The summer forecast is not good. Every province and territory will need to be on high alert. With so many so desperate for long-term rentals, do owners of short-term units own a share of the blame? I totally understand it helps you live a better quality of life, but if that comes at the expense of other people. Renters and Airbnb hosts face off. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Corrections Canada says it's giving the prison transfer of one of the country's most notorious killers a second look. An explosion of outrage met the news of Paul Bernardo's new home, a medium security prison in Quebec. In the decades since his conviction, many found some solace in believing the serial killer and rapist would serve his life sentence in a maximum security facility. That is not the case now, and politicians, experts, and the families of his victims have questions. And Catherine Cullen shows us, for critics, that's part of the issue, not just the transfer to a Quebec facility which specializes in treating violent sex offenders, but the secrecy around it. I was profoundly uh, concerned and, again, shocked by this decision. The public safety minister condemns the decision to move Paul Bernardo, but says he can't change it. It is important to underline that under the law, this is an, an independent decision. On Friday, news broke that the serial rapist and killer had already been transferred from this Ontario maximum security prison to a medium security one in Quebec. The families of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French feel re-victimized, says their lawyer. Shock and disbelief. And then when they were able to catch their breath and compose themselves, um, they asked the obvious question, why, on what basis, what criteria? Uh, and when I told them that uh, they would not answer that question uh, because of his privacy rights, uh, it was like putting a, a, you know, uh, a spike through their chest. Politicians also panned the move. I fully and totally understand how uh, shocked and appalled so many Canadians are. Mr. Bernardo is a monster and he d d belongs in maximum security. From Ontario Premier Doug Ford, Paul Bernardo should rot in a maximum security prison for the rest of his miserable existence, full stop. The Correctional Service of Canada now says the decision will be reviewed to ensure it was appropriate, evidence-based and more importantly, adequately considered victims. The fact that Corrections Canada, you know, within days of making the decision uh, is, is already saying they're going to review it, um, uh, to me is nothing other than a dodge. Um, you know, they know what their, their, their decision is. The review will be meaningless. He says the failure to explain why Bernardo was moved is also bad for public faith in the justice system. The minister says Canadians are owed answers, but they won't come from him. I think going forward it will be up to the Correctional Services of Canada to explain to Canadians exactly how these decisions are taken. So, Catherine, I suppose now the question is, where does this go from here? That's right, Adrian. I mean, this review is happening, and beyond the question of why, there are other questions, like whether he's now going to be part of the general prison population or still mostly in solitary confinement. Now, there's obviously a lot of public pressure for this decision to be reversed, but we don't know how this will go. The Conservatives are pressing the idea that Marco Mendicino could get involved here and overturn this decision. The lawyer for the family says he's less concerned about how this happens, but he says he expects the government to do whatever it takes to get Bernardo back in a maximum security prison. All right, Catherine Cullen in Ottawa, thank you. You're welcome. Radio Canada has confirmed that an organized crime figure has been shot dead west of Montreal. Francesco Del Balso was killed outside a gym in broad daylight. Del Balso was arrested in 2006 and convicted on gangsterism and drug charges. This is Quebec's third high-profile shooting linked to organized crime this year. Now to the story of Canada's wildfires. Tonight, about 250 are burning out of control in nine provinces and two territories. That is strange for this time of year. And the government warns that across this country, far worse probably lies ahead.
That eerie haze over Parliament seems to suit the dire forecast, and in a minute, we'll tell you what's in store for summer. But first, the crisis in Quebec that is spreading as we speak. So that red shading shows just how much of the province is at an elevated risk. And these are the fires burning right now, about 154 of them. Thousands are out of their homes tonight, and the province admits the widespread threat is overwhelming resources. Alison Northcott shows us what they're up against. This is one of a growing number of fires putting Quebec communities at risk. For some, the threat is imminent. The 2,000 residents of La Belle sur Quevillon have left, and as flames and smoke closed in, even some firefighters had to get out. We want to keep our town, says Mayor Guy Lafreniere, but with the winds and no rain in the forecast, he says he doesn't know what the coming days will bring. Tous les chemins forestiers sont barrés. Jenny Fortier had to leave her home quickly on Friday. She had to abandon her cats, and it's too dangerous to go back. We don't even know if we'll see our houses again, she says, or our town the way it was. In Setil, thousands of residents forced from their homes still can't return. There are still concerns about the fire's progress. Our priority is to protect our citizens. Canadian Armed Forces members are here for backup, learning to use the firefighting tools they'll need. We're just going to be there, you know, next to a set of, uh, of hands to, to help out. That help is badly needed. There are more fires burning than the province can handle, and resources are stretched. One fire destroyed a fishing outfitter owned by the Inu community of Washat Mak Maniutinam. Everything was uh, burned and uh... It's a very, uh, very big loss for the community of Washat Macmaintinam. But that community has support. Senator Michelle Odette came to help her mother and other evacuees in the First Nation of Pesamit. I went where they wanted to, me to be, and the kitchen. We serve uh, close to 1,000 meal almost per day. Uh, it's a lot, and it's also comfort food to reassure them. As the fires continue, Quebec is getting help from firefighters from the U.S. and France, and it could turn to other countries for more support, too. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. So how can things get worse than that? Here's Ashley Burke with that federal forecast, a summer of fiery destruction that could be like nothing seen before. Officials say this season has already brought some of the most dramatic wildfires Canadians have ever seen. Now a new warning, this summer could get even worse. Every province and territory will need to be on high alert. As smoke from Quebec hung over Parliament Hill, Justin Trudeau and his ministers delivered what they called a sobering national update. There have been 2,214 wildfires nationally so far this year, and approximately 3.3 million hectares have been burned. 3.3 million hectares is an area larger than Vancouver Island and 13 times higher than the 10-year average at this time of year. This is a scary time for a lot of people, not just in Alberta, but right across the country. New federal data show more than 400 active fires across the country and project warm and dry conditions in June, putting land from B.C. all the way to western Quebec at risk until the end of August. It is expected that we have enough resources to cover the summer. If things get worse, uh, we have, uh, we are developing contingency plans. Those plans could include more international support. 950 international firefighters are already here. That need to be taken down and... Canadian Armed Forces are also deployed to three provinces. The official opposition said it will throw its support behind whatever the government does to help. We would be open to studying any uh, solutions that will help the country better coordinate its water bombers and other assets. The government's urging Canadians to take extreme care this summer in forested areas to avoid starting fires in the first place and help keep these stark projections from becoming a reality. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. At least 42 people are dead in Haiti after heavy rains caused some widespread flooding. Authorities say thousands were forced to flee as their homes became submerged. More than 85 people were injured. Several are still missing. The capital, Port-au-Prince, is one of the most affected areas. To Ukraine now, where the fog of war is getting thicker. Ukraine says it's gained ground around the hard-hit city of Bakhmut. Russia says it destroyed 28 tanks, including eight Leopard 2s 
and killed some 1,500 Ukrainian troops. Those numbers aren't verified, but what is apparent, the fighting is intensifying. Briar Stewart has more from London. Just five kilometers from the border, war is the backdrop for life in the Ukrainian city of Vovchensk. After recent incursions by anti-Kremlin militia groups into Russia, the fighting has become more intense. Some of the residents who remain spend much of their time sitting in underground cellars and listening. It landed somewhere there near the tractor factory, this man said. But the fiercest fighting is south in Donetsk. Russia's defense ministry released this unverified footage, which it claims shows its military repelling a Ukrainian attack. Ukraine dismissed Russia's claims and released this promotional video. It urged citizens to be silent and not share any information about Ukraine's battlefield positions. But it also said that some of its troops are moving to offensive actions in some areas, including in Bakhmut. Um, I suspect that what we may be seeing at the moment are diversionary attacks and deception operations. This defense expert says he believes Ukraine's counteroffensive is already underway and the pressure is on. The Western world is expecting to see some uh, it was some activity for all this uh, equipment that's been given to Ukraine and all the training. And politically, the Ukrainians have got to show that they can change the dynamics on the battlefield. Thank you very much. Thank Ukraine's you. President Volodymyr Zelensky met with the UK's Foreign Secretary, part of the latest delegation to Thank come so through much. Kiev. We are very thankful for all that big support, really big support, what uh, UK gave. Ukrainian officials say they now have enough weapons to start the counteroffensive, but not necessarily enough to win the war. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Prince Harry did not show up at a scheduled court appearance in the UK today. He's one of over 100 high-profile figures suing the Mirror Group newspapers. They allege that the paper hacked phones between 1991 and 2011, then used the contents of those calls for various stories. Despite today's absence, Harry is expected to take the stand tomorrow. Now to a high-profile criminal case in Australia, where a woman is free tonight after decades in prison, convicted of killing her four children in four separate instances over a period of 10 years. Thomas Daglin now with the new scientific evidence that suggests she's innocent. Considered for years a notorious serial killer, Kathleen Falbig was convicted of murdering her own children. She spent two decades behind bars as Australia's most hated woman. Now she's free after what her supporters consider a miscarriage of justice. This has been a terrible ordeal. Uh, for everyone concerned, and I hope that uh, our actions today um, can put some closure on this. Falbig's four young children, all under the age of two, each died suddenly over the span of a decade. In 2003, prosecutors alleged Falbig suffocated them, and a jury convicted her, though she always maintained her innocence. Kathy, did you kill Carla? No! Did you kill Patrick? No. Did you try to kill Patrick on that New Year's service? <laughs> no. But the prosecution pointed to Falbig's own diary entries as evidence of guilt. An inquiry found they were the writings of a grieving mother who blamed herself. What do you think is the percentage of likelihood that Ms. Falbig is innocent? Based on our research, I think it's close to 100%. Professor Carola Vinuesa and other scientists spent years examining the case. They found two of Falbig's children had a rare genetic mutation linked to heart failure, and all four likely died naturally. To feel that it's been finally heard, that, um, you know, it, it's a triumph for science. The new evidence raised enough doubt about Falbig's conviction for the state to release her. How would any of you feel to have that happen to you? It's unimaginable. At age 55, Falbig may be due compensation, but first she'll need to formally appeal her conviction. Now, though, she's free, and Australian TV showed her embracing a close friend, among the few who believed her all along. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. 
Four years ago, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls issued 231 calls for justice, actionable steps to save lives. CBC Manitoba has been tracking progress on those steps. And as Stephanie Cram tells us, it's been painfully slow. Rain or shine, hundreds come out to remember the dead. Last year, Winnipeg marked a grim record, 10 Indigenous women killed. Hilda Anderson Pierce is an advocate with painful personal experience. She testified at the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in 2018. Her sister Dawn Anderson was found dead in the snow in 2011. She loved life, you know, she loved her children, she loved new experiences and, and opportunities, like everything that life had to offer her. The inquiry's final report in 2019 includes 231 calls for justice to protect Indigenous women and girls. An investigation by CBC Manitoba found that only two of those calls for justice have been completed. More than half, 123, have not been started. Ending this crisis will require ongoing collaboration, investments and initiatives from all levels of government. Mark Miller says his government is also prioritizing a red dress alert to notify all Canadians when an Indigenous woman or girl goes missing. I try not to to cry every day or to, to be angry because I am mad. The commission says the calls for justice are not recommendations, but legal imperatives. These are the priorities for those who participate. You don't have to recreate something. Just implement Anderson Pierce says all calls for justice have to be acted on at once without some being prioritized over others. The um, action has to be more effective and more concrete, you know, to be able to create those pathways and those supports and resources, you know, that can end the genocide that is occurring in this country. Anderson Pierce says Indigenous women and girls continue to experience racism and violence and that implementing the calls for justice will save lives. Stephanie Cram, CBC News, Winnipeg. CBC News in Manitoba has launched Mother, Sister, Daughter. That is a project that explores the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Through 18 chapters, family members discuss their personal experiences in seeking justice for their loved ones. You can go to cbc.ca slash MMIWG. Well, Mike Pence is taking a run at becoming the next U.S. president. Pence filed his paperwork this morning. He is expected to hold an event to launch his campaign on Wednesday. A run to lead the Republican Party has long been expected for the former vice president, but he's coming in as a heavy underdog with Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis viewed as the front runners. And the U.S. federal securities regulator is suing the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange company. So it alleges that Binance misused investor funds and inflated trading volumes. Last year, Binance processed trades worth about $65 billion a day. And Apple has unveiled its first virtual reality headset, and in doing so, the company's entering a field with plenty of players, though none of them have been able to make VR mainstream. So can Apple succeed where all others have failed? Peter Armstrong explores. For a long stretch there, VR was heralded as the next big thing. Sony, PlayStation and Google launched new products. Facebook changed its name to Meta, creating its own interactive platform. From now on, we're going to be metaverse first. Even credulous reporters bought into the hype. It is unlike anything else that I've ever done. I'm going 106 miles an hour. It was unique, it was novel, but like many, even most technological innovations, VR failed to deliver. It just never became essential. Last year, the Wall Street Journal reported that six months after purchase, more than half of MetaQuest's headsets were no longer in use. We've had the big hype. Uh, that, that hasn't quite lived up to, uh, reality hasn't quite lived up to the hype. This tech entrepreneur says the existing VR headsets haven't delivered, but he says that doesn't mean the next generation won't deliver. We're just on the cusp of this, uh, of the technology going mainstream. And who's better at bringing tech to the mainstream than Apple? This is a day that's been years in the making. At the core of Apple's brand is the notion that the company fundamentally changed how we use computers phones, watches. Now it wants to reset what we talk about when we talk about VR, not as a gaming console or teleconferencing tool. Apple sees an opportunity to get even more of your attention. 
Hey, do you like being on an airplane and having noise cancellation? Well, why don't you strap this thing to your face and tune out the whole world? Um, and I, I think it shows how Apple always understands the consumer dynamics of consumer electronics much better than most tech companies. And that consumer electronics is going to cost you. The headset runs 3500 US. That's a whopping $4,700 Canadian. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. The smoke from raging wildfires is spreading across the country and it could affect your health. It can go all the way down into our lungs and cross over into our bloodstream. What you can do to protect yourself. Canadian renters are facing higher prices and fewer options. Is Airbnb making it worse? But slowly I will be converting everything to short-term rentals. If this keeps happening, I'm gonna move out of the city for sure, but potentially even move out of the country. I speak with people on both sides of the issue. Happy birthday to you. And a birthday wish finally comes true. They offered way more than I could have even hoped that they would. We're back in two. Investigators are pouring over the Virginia crash site of a plane that triggered alerts had fighter jets scrambling. They reportedly saw the pilot slumped over the controls. The plane lost contact with air traffic control yesterday as it approached Washington, D.C. Officials say all four on board died. Now, as you heard earlier, this is a ferocious fire season in several provinces simultaneously, all feeding into a storm of smoke so vast it's hard to avoid, even in parts of Canada where fires are scarce. Lauren Pelly spoke with doctors about what that means for your health. The sky in Montreal looked gloomy, all thanks to smoke from more than 150 forest fires still raging elsewhere in Quebec, including Val d'Or, 500 kilometres northwest, where evacuations began over the weekend, and fumes are inescapable. It's all over the place. You go outside, you smell it. It's even with just opening a window for a few seconds. Across the country, multiple regions are now facing air quality statements, some far beyond the wildfire zones. In Toronto, a haze hung over the downtown core. We know that wildfire smoke causes widespread inflammation. This physician says it's all made up of pollutants, which can become more harmful to human health the more you're exposed. So people who work outside, people who are experiencing homelessness and spending a lot of time outdoors, uh, the risks to those folks will be higher. Environment Canada says people with heart or lung disease, asthma, pregnant individuals, and both children and seniors are also at high risk, even from small amounts of smoke. It can go all the way down into our lungs and not only cause topical uh, irritation through all of our respiratory linings, but actually cross over into our bloodstream. A research team studied a bad wildfire season in Canada's north and found a rise in hospital visits linked to asthma, pneumonia and COPD. You may want to shelter in place because you don't want to get out there um, and be breathing in more terrible air. And doctors say if you have to go outside in the smog, consider wearing something you might still have at home, a well-fitting N95 mask. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. More Canadian landlords are choosing Airbnb over renting long term. Prior to us starting our Airbnb, we had rented it to, to someone that actually damaged our property. I sit down with renters and Airbnb hosts. If we have housing that's planned, zoned, designed, built for housing, that shouldn't be turned into hotel stock. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. If this keeps happening, I'm gonna move out of the city for sure, but potentially even move out of the country. I wouldn't be looking to sort of exploit uh, something that I view as a, a basic human right. You're paying more for your bread and food, why, your gas, why are you not paying more for your rent and you expect me to fork up that money, right? I want to pay down my mortgage. I want to, um, you know, be able to get ahead. We cannot let the market go to the Wild West. 
So, fact, Canadians are struggling to find housing. That's not news to you. It's a matter of affordability and stock. But we do keep wondering, what else is there to the story? To what degree, for example, do short-term rentals contribute to this crisis? Well, the answer may depend what side of the table you're sitting on. In studio, we have a table with Airbnb hosts and renters. We also have Armenia Alnesian, The Economist, backstage listening in. So we're going to have a conversation and try to sort this out. Come with us. Hey, everybody. How you doing? How's it going? Good, you? good, good. Okay. Christian, Samantha, Shuby, Brendan, thanks for being with us. I just, Pleasure. can we just start off with a bit of a gut check here? <laughs> Hand up if you think the answer is yes to the question, short-term rentals are contributing to the housing crisis. Uh-huh. Okay, well, I, okay, maybe, maybe I shouldn't entirely be surprised in that uh, both of you are, are tenants right now. So, Christian, your, your body language suggests there's no way you think it's part of the problem. Um, I have to say absolutely not. I think I'm a landlord and a short-term operator, so I see both sides of the story. Um, I don't think we should be responsible for the housing crisis Five, six years ago, uh, when I got into the industry of short term, somebody said, let's put an Airbnb, make more money. So I, I got in and I'm like, oh, wow, I was collecting $2,000 in rent. Now I'm making five, $6,000 a month. Mm -hmm. I'm like, not only am I able to cover all expenses, but have a better quality of life. And what about the, the places that you rent out as long-term rentals? Are they going to stay long-term rentals? Uh, for the time being, yes. Um, but slowly I will be converting everything to short-term rentals. Uh, okay, so how does that land with the tenants in the house here? It's really hard to grasp the crushing reality of how expensive and limited it is. Like five months, I saw every month average rent for places I was looking at go up and up and up and up. Because you had a bit of a rough go, eh? Yeah, yeah. Everything in our neighborhood was going to triple our rent, uh, but we had to move out. We were asked to, and we found a place that it was five units in a building, in a mm -hmm. small building, each four bedroom. We actually offered six months in advance, $24,000. And despite offering that, we got rejected. We found out the competing bid mm -hmm. was a person who offered to lease all five, six units. Mm -hmm. And they're turning it into Airbnb rentals. Mm -hmm. If this keeps happening, I'm gonna move out of the city for sure but potentially even move out of the country. Wow. We're in a, a situation with housing shortage in pretty much every city across Canada. I don't think you can really afford, at least of all the tenants, can afford for any of that housing to be given up to a kind of superfluous cause. I mean, I totally understand it helps you live a better quality of life, but if that comes at the expense of other people, being able to afford to live even sort of a basic uh, standard of living, then I think that is problematic. But, but why is that Christian's responsibility, right? Like, uh, you say superfluous, mm -hmm. you might say, hey, that's my income. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why does he have to take that on? Uh, I mean, so I, I think at some point it comes down to sort of like personal morals and, and ethics. I wouldn't be looking to sort of exploit uh, something that I view as a, a basic human right. Everyone should have a right to, to housing. For a long time, landlords have, have done long-term rentals and it's mm -hmm. made them plenty of money. So I'd like to jump in here, actually, Eight months, I'm going without a tenant paying me rent. Mm -hmm. Eight months of me paying out of my pocket and my quality of life, mm -hmm. whether I cannot take my family on vacation, have mm -hmm. to stress, work overtime. This is, I think, a big reason why people are switching to short-term rentals because if you're in an Airbnb and you're past your checkout, your reservation is no longer there. Mm -hmm. At this point, the police comes, you're trespassing, you're out the same minute. I feel like you might have empathy at both sides of the table here. I do, I do. Um, so in Calgary, we have a, a, a townhouse that we rent. We have a wonderful renter there, and, um, and it gives us peace of mind. Um, prior to us starting our Airbnb, we had rented it to, to someone that actually damaged our property and had to put in money to get it back to a, a regular estate. So we thought, you know what, this is, this is a great opportunity for us to try Airbnb. And it really is, it does give us that peace of mind that we are protected when there is a situation um, that we might not be able to collect from our renter. We did reach out to Airbnb because mostly it is such a huge player. They maintain that, that 
53% of their hosts are a bit like you and that they use the platform strictly to deal with the rising costs. Mm -hmm. That's it. So I, with the variable um, mortgage rates that are going up, the prices go up there, our condo fees have gone up, everything has gone up. So for us to um, really just be able to kind of have that offset, it's, it's quite a nice mm -hmm. advantage. It is really hard when we think of housing as investment commodity to, we distance it from our, like the reality of it, that it's shelter, it's a basic need for people. And we kind of like, you know, forget the human aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really big issue. Well, I have to disagree because I am actually, I try to be as fair and, and honest with my tenants and everything. If there is any changes, I will give them a good amount of notice or whatever the problem is, I will talk to them. I want to be just one of those get out, let's do it. But I'm not sure, like, you are not more profitable and a better position because you own a property as a rental property. Even 10 years ago, before interest rate hikes, before prices went bananas, thank you. Then why do it? Because the long-term growth of, you're hoping for the long-term growth of the unit. And so that's- it is, So it is a financially correct, beneficial thing. Correct, but okay. for you to say that just because you have equity in the house that you cannot refinance or take out, I can have a million dollars in my house right now. I cannot take it out because I cannot qualify thanks to the interest rates or whatever. Now, short-term rental has come into the play where people start reaping the, benef the benefits of real estate immediately. <laughs> Our government, again, I don't want to be that guy saying the government, the government, the government, but it's not my responsibility to fix a government mm -hmm. job. I pay enough taxes that mm -hmm. <laughs> they should be doing their job. Why don't they decrease the time that a builder needs to wait for permits to build a 50-foot story? Because if that's the case, Toronto was one of the longest wait times around the world, I believe, for them to get permits to build. That's not my problem. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not here for charity. Well, I mean, we have to figure this out. I mean, in, in, <laughs> in, in this city, like 50%-ish of the population rents. And so with such a low vacancy rate, it's lowest in this country it's been in, yep. in some 20 years. I think it's like roughly 1% in Halifax. That's true, yeah. You know, it's, I've been there for around three years in the same building, um, and I know in the time that I've been there, my, the market price for my unit has effectively doubled. When the most recent landlord took over, he sort of approached me at the beginning and made it clear that his intention was to turn my unit into an Airbnb. Um, and I'm in a three unit building, all of the other units are Airbnbs. So absolutely you feel, it's kind of put me in this position where I feel like I have to be an extra good tenant. To hedge my bets, I should you know, take that little extra step. I take care of the garbage for the Airbnbs that are in the, you know, I take the bins out and whatever. I, I actually think you're, I, I would never let you go if I had a triplex and you're one of my tenants there that does all that, I would never let you go. I would never jack up your rent and all stuff because I think you're like such a massive asset to that building. Uh, but on the other hand is if you're owning single family homes or condos, when my payment's going from $2,500 to $3,600, mm -hmm. condo fees are going up every year, uh, sorry, every year, and then property taxes are going up, that just, uh, like, we cannot expect tenants to say, hey, I've been here for 20 years, so I'm going to pay 900 bucks here. Well, the whole world is moving. You're paying more for your bread and food, why, your gas. Why are you not paying more for your rent and you expect me to fork up that money, right? I, I do want to ask, though, like, these issues that you have had, would you say that they're a majority of your tenants or a minority? Um, lucky. I've had minority, however, damages from tenants and me paying out of pocket has been pretty consistent mm -hmm. after they leave the property. Mm -hmm. It's just, I, you know, because I, I feel like I hear this kind of thing a lot from landlords. I'm not saying there are bad tenants in the world. They're, they're in the minority. And so I think it's kind of blown out of proportion that, oh, I need to use Airbnb as a crutch because every tenant or mm -hmm. there's too much risk. You're profiting off of this housing. It's a business, you know, the cost of doing business, frankly. Yeah, um, but, but going personally bankrupt because of the minority of tenants is unacceptable in anyone's eyes. You Imagine, went personally bankrupt? No, I'm saying if I didn't have the means to cover the mortgage, guess what? Mm -hmm. Mortgage goes default, gets on your bureau, you have to declare bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So that minority, that one tenant can ruin your life for, for good mm -hmm. but I guess in my, Canada. My point is that um, that hasn't happened to you yet and it probably won't happen to you. And I don't think that it's because you're using Airbnb, it's because generally speaking, you're in a profitable business model and you're gonna be just fine. I totally get it's not your responsibility to kind of solve all the social woes of, of Canada um, with housing, 
we also should talk about this with some empathy for the people that might get forced out in this way because in a lot of cases it's not their fault either, you know. Okay, so this is where we're almost stuck and this is where we need some help. So we're going to take a break, <laughs> take a breath and get our mean in, okay? All right. You are sucking out stock. You're sucking it out faster than it can be built. Do you see any model anywhere that offers a solution? Okay, so we've established that we understand the problem here. It's very personal. We need some solutions. Uh, we need a reality check. Perfect timing. Armenia Elnesian, uh, help us out here. I know you were listening and watching. What, what struck you? How amazingly engaging this conversation is. You all are bringing such an important aspect of something that is a problem for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. So when you say problem, can, can you give us a sense of where Canada sits compared to the rest of the world? Like how big of a problem is, is housing affordability? Now? Well, there are two features that are really quite unique for Canada. Number one is that can, the Canadian population has grown faster than any other big nation mm -hmm. in the last year. Uh, it's been uh, just a bonanza of more people coming into the country. Um, and that's great news for a lot of reasons, but really challenging when you don't build housing at the pace that we've been permitting and welcoming people to come to the country. And the second part is that of the 37 richest countries in the world, Canada is right last bottom, bottom of the list in terms of social housing. Mm -hmm. We have disinvested through governments. I mean, to Christian's point about what is government's role in all of this, in every other country, governments are responsible for building a bigger stock of affordable housing. We cannot expect the market to do all of the heavy lifting on affordability. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we cannot let the market go to the Wild West in terms of driving up prices because it's good for you guys. So like, yeah, I'm really torn in these stories, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. well, in terms of short-term rentals though, I, I mean, anecdotally it can feel, if, if you're a tenant, it can feel like they are adding to the, to the housing crisis. Do you know from the time I was first asked to be part of this mm -hmm. and I started looking at the data, we added 2,000 long-term listings in Toronto. That is less than a month. 2,000 new listings have been added to Airbnb. I mean, we're, we're just sucking out. We cannot build fast enough. Your point Correct. was we're, we're taking too long to build. You guys are sucking out. You are sucking out stock. You're sucking it out faster than it can be built. We have a problem. In a city like Toronto, where rent went up by 20% for a bachelor unit, rent went up by 16% for one bedroom and three bedroom units compared to a year ago, those rents would not be escalating as quickly. Just on mm. Airbnb alone, there are 15,000 long-term rentals available today. So if you were somehow by some magic wand able to convert some of those into legit long-term rentals, right? A year, two years, like people do when they need a place to live, that would add so much stock that it would reduce the pressure on how much rents are rising. So you might be making more money, you might be making more money, which is totally legit, totally understandable, has this ripple effect through uh, real estate markets throughout the country, especially in major markets, but also in secondary markets. So you can see where the tension is coming in, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Samantha, did you tell us that in the unit you lived in, you have an Airbnb? But you also have another I place. long-term rent, uh, rental property, which is a, our townhouse. And then we have our basement suite in our home. Right. And the long-term tenant, mm -hmm. did, did I get it right that once that person leaves who you like, you see the advantages of moving to Airbnb? So starting, when we first started, it really was to offset our expenses. Sure. And, and you do, you do see the, the benefits of it. And, and I'm, I, I'm not saying that I would evict anyone or, or so on, but I am looking it at, I want to pay down my mortgage. I want to, um, you know, be able to get ahead in a way. And so there, the, the, yes, it, it would be attractive to do so. Yeah, I... I think if it's within your primary residence, I think it's maybe a different story. But I think it's when it's a secondary property um, as a tenant, of course I'm biased, but it's better if it ends up on the long-term market. When Airbnb was launched in 2007, mm -hmm. it was precisely to help people offset their costs and manage who they had in the house and have a little bit more control. It has gone out of control. 
everybody that's been in variable or fixed rates that took it during the pandemic, they better expect a 40 to 50% increase of their payment. We keep forgetting about that. That's the reason why rents keep going up. A hundred percent. And I'm, I'm not arguing with you that if the money is there to be made, it's like candy for a baby. Why wouldn't you take it? That's why we need regulations. Brendan is also right. You're a businessman. That's how you're describing what Correct. you're doing. You make your money through real estate. That has risks. Again, this, I agree with you. Why, instead of, instead of them raising 3.5%, 4% in a year's time, why do they not raising quarter percent at the time for people can adjust their living expenses and everything? What are you going to do about their wages? About... Again. Their wages, like if you do a quarter percent at a time, but their wages don't go up, what are you going to do about okay. it? Look, it isn't somebody else's problem, is my point. It is our problem. If we can talk about regulation just for a moment. I think if you're, if you're reading the news and, and, you're, and you may have heard people talk about Quebec, right? Quebec is trying new regulations with Airbnb. Mm -hmm. But what are those regulations and are they going to work? So Quebec's new introduction is to make people like Christian more accountable for how he's running his business. He needs to register mm -hmm. and he needs to prove that the people that they're getting are legitimately staying there long term. But I, I, have to, I, I have to say, this isn't about good operators and bad operators. It is not enough places for Canadians to live. I think part of the solution has to be that if we have housing that's planned, zoned, designed, built for housing, that shouldn't be turned into hotel stock. Do you see any model anywhere that offers a solution? The only model that exists anywhere, it is in New York City, it is in places like Quebec that is really cracking down, and we could actually bring it further along in a place like Toronto, is to really be much more ruthless about your business model. To prevent, like, you are right, it's not being regulated and enforced enough. Why are there any multiple listings now? But that is the way we have to go. Sometimes the most absolutely blindingly simple business decision that makes perfect sense for an individual business turns out to be suicide for an economy. It's mm. good for you, it's good for you, it's terrible for them, and they are the future, not you. It's pretty eye-popping. Christian, Samantha, Shuby, Brendan, Armin, as always, thank you. So much to say. We're going to keep digging into the housing crisis. We want to hear from you. Send your stories and questions to the national at cbc.ca or you can message us on Instagram. Next, a wish becomes reality for this PEI grandfather. You can't explain it, really. I've never seen anything like this in my life. How his family arranged this once-in-a-lifetime birthday tour in our moment. So PEI's Leonard Wood, who's right in the center there, loves cruise ships. He loves them so much that he often gets his picture taken with them, but he's always been on the outside looking in, had never set foot on one. That is until now, because just last week, his family surprised him with a tour for his 87th birthday. His dream come true is our moment. Happy birthday. After my heart attack, I say to my daughter, I say, is there a big cruise ship in? Yeah, right there, she said. Can you see it? <laughs> That's when I wanted to see it. Planes and boats, ever since I was 14. I put a post on Ask PEI. Zandam was the one, Holland America was the one that reached out. They offered way more than I could have even hoped that they would, because it's wow. something that I could never <laughs> imagine being able to give him. Such an important memory to make. We'll, you were beautiful we'll, woman. We'll you. pretend it's a slow dance. All right. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you something right sure now. She is one of the best daughters that a father could have. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today talking to you. You have to have them beautiful memories, eh? Well, they mean a lot to a person, especially a family. You have to have family. <laughs> So Leonard's had a bit of a rough go health-wise. We all hope you're okay. And, uh, you know, kudos to his daughter. It's one thing to look after some, someone. It's, it's something else to go as far as Robin does all the time for her dad. That is a national for June the 5th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.